God has given us a sign that he is our creator. Has this sign been forgotten and trampled on by men? What does the Bible say about the Sabbath today? Hi, this is Dustin with Hope Through Prophecy. On this channel, we help you to better understand Bible prophecy and be prepared for the soon return of Jesus. If you're new, please subscribe and turn on all bell notifications so you see all of our new uploads. This video is part of a series called Final Days. To watch this full series in order, just click on the link in the description below. To receive the notes for this meeting and all the others in this series, make sure to register for free by clicking the link above. Before we consider the Sabbath, we must first consider a foundational characteristic about God, His creative power. When it comes to the question of the origin of life, you have only two basic positions. There is a God or there isn't. Either God has always existed and brought about the creation of the cosmos, or they came about purely by chance. As we look around in nature and study the amazing complexity of even the simplest forms of life, we realize that God has left His fingerprints throughout the universe. From the smallest living organism to the amazing far reaches of outer space, we find evidence of a Creator God, a God that shaped the world, a God that fashioned the world. This confirms the theme we have chosen for these meetings. If it's in the Bible, we want it. If it's not in the Bible, it's not for us. The book of Revelation describes a vision in which John was brought to the very throne of this all-powerful Creator God. Here in this vision, in Revelation 4, we find a clarion call for men and women living in Earth's final hour to return to the worship of the Creator God. Come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. In prophetic vision, John travels to the throne room of the universe and hears these sounds of praise. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. All of heaven sings. Some scientists may not know how life arose or how the universe got here, but all of heaven knows because all the angels sing. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. Why? Because you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. We did not evolve by some cosmic accident. We were created by a loving God. Before you existed in the womb of your mother, you existed in the mind of God. God fashioned you. God shaped you. God created you. The book of Revelation calls humanity back to worshiping the Creator. There is an answer to the question of human origins. It is found in the book of Revelation. It is part of his end time message for all people. Revelation calls us to fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. In an age of evolution, God sends a message to the entire human race calling for us to worship the creator. This is a message for all of us. It is not a message of one religious group or another. It is not a message of one denomination or another. It is God's final call to all of His people. It is a call to worship the Creator. And how do we worship the Creator, the Creator of heaven and earth? How does He remind us of His creative power? At creation, did He leave us with a symbol of His creative authority? Revelation is a book of endings. We can only understand the book of endings if we understand the book of beginnings. We will only understand the significance of the monumental issues in today's world if we understand the events at creation. Revelation's final call for the entire human race to worship the Creator has its origin in Genesis, the book of beginnings. The theme of true worship, remembering the Creator, is a common thread throughout the Bible. It is one of the most important themes of Scripture. The heart of Revelation's final crisis is over true and false worship. Worshiping the Creator is at the center of it all. Let's return to our origin so we can understand our destiny. This amazingly intricate world as we know it today was created in six literal days. 
Our Creator spoke and the earth came into existence. God dazzled it with light, enveloped it with atmosphere, brightened it with babbling brooks and flowing rivers, and colored it with beautiful flowers and plants, enlivened it with an incredible variety of living things, day by day, looking upon His handiwork and saying, It is good. And then came the crowning act of creation. Turning to the Father, the Creator said, Let us make man in our image. In the image of God, He created him. Male and female, He created them. Man could receive no greater honor. God could have shown no greater love. The human race is God's masterpiece of creation, the object of His supreme love. After the creation of Adam and Eve on the sixth day, the Bible says, Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. Just six days of work and creation was done. Such a short time, but not for God. But the account of creation is not over on the sixth day. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. God rested? Why? He was pleased with his accomplishments over earth's first six days. Then God did something especially significant. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. The seventh day Sabbath, given at creation, was to be God's perpetual reminder of our roots. Let's look at three specific things God did on the seventh day. One, God blessed it. The Bible said God blessed the seventh day. He made the seventh day an endless fountain of spiritual refreshing for his people for all time to come. Number two, God sanctified it. Next, he sanctified the seventh day. He set it apart as a holy day, a special time every seven days to continually remind us of our beginnings, our roots. Number three, God rested on it. The Bible does not say that God blessed the first day or the third day or the fifth or any other day except the seventh. And what God blesses, according to 1 Chronicles 17, 27, He blesses forever. To bless is to infuse something with God's very presence. God blessed the seventh day by making it an eternal sign of His powerful creation and infinite love. God rested on the seventh day, not because He was tired, but because He knew we would be tired. God sanctified the seventh day. He set it apart for holy use. The word sanctified is the word used by God for the marriage ceremony when one woman is set apart or sanctified for one man. Let's suppose a man gets married. The woman he marries has six sisters. After the ceremony, he's waiting in the car, getting ready to go on the honeymoon. One of her sisters slips in beside him and says, let's go. He looks at her amazed and responds, I didn't marry you, I married your sister. Her reply is, what difference does it make? I'm one in seven. Does it make any difference, friend? To the married couple, it certainly does. There was one who was sanctified, set apart for him. All women are not the same, and all days are not the same. The Sabbath was created by God 2300 years before the existence of the Jewish race. It was given to our first parents, Adam and Eve, in the Garden of Eden. The Sabbath was set aside at creation as an eternal symbol of God's creative power for His people in every age. When Adam and Eve left the Garden, the Sabbath remained as a reminder of God's eternal love. Throughout both the Old and New Testament, the Sabbath is a sign between God and His people. Before He gave the Israelites the Ten Commandment Law on Mount Sinai, they were keeping the Sabbath of creation. In Exodus 16, we read the remarkable story of the falling of the manna. The Lord said, Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, there will be none. God worked a miracle for Israel. He met their needs by raining bread down from heaven. This bread, or manna, fell every day except the Sabbath. If the Israelites gathered more than they could eat, the leftover portion spoiled. When some Israelites went out to gather manna on the Sabbath, God said, How long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? On Mount Sinai, God wrote with his own finger on tables of stone the Sabbath commandments. 
He didn't write these commandments in the sand to be washed away. He did not write them on parchment to be consumed in some fire. God did not write the Sabbath command on a little piece of paper hidden in a corner. God wrote on tables of stone. God wrote the law to endure forever. God didn't even entrust Moses to write it. God didn't entrust one of the prophets to write it. Let me ask you something. If in the Bible there is only one set of laws written with God's own finger, if God wrote them on tables of stone, how can we turn our backs on the eternal law of God written with His own finger? The Bible says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. We can keep holy only what God has made holy. Human beings can't make something holy. God made the Sabbath holy. He blessed it at creation. He says, what's the first word? Remember. Why did God say remember? He knew we would forget. He knew in an age of evolution, men and women would forget the Sabbath. So God said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. God is calling us back to his eternal sign of creation. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work. Notice he doesn't say a seventh day is the Sabbath. He says the seventh day is the Sabbath. And just as the day before your birthday and the day after your birthday do not commemorate the day you were born, the first day, the third day, or the fourth day do not commemorate the birth of the earth by the Creator God. He tells us why we are to worship on the seventh day. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. The Ten Commandment Law quotes Genesis and leads us back to when God created the earth. The Sabbath was never an exclusively Jewish institution. It was given for all humanity. Just as the commandment, Thou shalt not kill, is not only for the Jews, just as the commandment, Thou shalt not worship any graven image, is not only for the Jews, the Sabbath is not exclusively a Jewish Sabbath. It was given to our first parents long before the existence of the Jewish nation. It is for all Old Testament and New Testament believers. The Bible says, The Sabbath is made for man, all humanity everywhere. Everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath, I will bring to my holy mountain. What's God's holy mountain? What's that? New Jerusalem, heaven. He says, Everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath, I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. For my house should be called a house of prayer for all nations. He says, All nations will one day worship around my throne in the new Jerusalem each Sabbath. Throughout the Old Testament, the Sabbath was God's everlasting sign for all of his people. Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between them and me that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. The Sabbath is not only a sign that God created us, it is a sign that he can recreate our hearts. When I come to worship him on the Sabbath, I say, God, you are the all-powerful creator. You can recreate my heart. God gave the Sabbath to Adam and Eve at creation. God gave the Sabbath to Moses in the Ten Commandment Law. He gave the Sabbath as a sign through the Old Testament of his power to recreate hearts. He gave the Sabbath as a sign of his love to us and a symbol of his divine authority. But, somebody asked, what about the New Testament? What about Jesus Christ? Did Jesus come to do away with the Sabbath? Did the disciples change the Sabbath? Did they worship on another day? Let's look at the New Testament. What did Jesus teach about the Bible Sabbath? So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. Jesus Christ worshiped on the Sabbath. If Jesus wanted to leave another sign or symbol of worship, wouldn't you expect him to leave us a positive example in his life? Isn't it true that a person's will and testament is sealed by their death? You cannot change a person's will after they die. And Christ's will and testament was sealed at his death. But the legacy of his life was, read with me, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. Indeed, Christ kept the Bible Sabbath. He said himself, 
The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. It does not say the Sabbath was made for the Jew. The Sabbath was made for man. Was the Sabbath made for the Jew? It was, yes. The Jew is a man, but it was made for all humanity. The Sabbath was made for Jews and Gentiles alike as a sign of God's creation. It's a sign that we worship Him exclusively. It is a sign that we love Him supremely. We were not made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made as God's gift to us. Adam and Eve were made first. The Sabbath is God's love gift to the human race. Every Sabbath, we flee from the stresses of life to His palace in time. The tensions of life evaporate in His presence. The Sabbath is an eternal sign that He created us. After dying for our sins, Jesus rested in the grave on the Sabbath. His closest followers rested according to the commandments. They wouldn't even embalm His body on the Sabbath. The day before, Jesus resurrected on the first day of the week. Jesus kept the Sabbath and all of His Father's commandments. And He tells us, If you love me, keep my commandments. Love leads us to obedience. Love leads us to keep His commandments. Jesus told His disciples that even after His death, even after the crucifixion, even after the resurrection, they would be keeping the Sabbath. One day Jesus gathered his disciples together and discussed the coming destruction of Jerusalem and pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. Why? What sense would it make for Jesus to say to his disciples, pray that your flight not be on the Sabbath if they were not going to be keeping the Sabbath? It wouldn't have made any sense at all. Why did he say that? If they were all worshiping on the Sabbath, which he expected them to, together in one place, and the Roman armies attacked the city, what would have happened? The Roman armies would have destroyed them. Jerusalem was destroyed in A.D. 70, years after Jesus had already ascended to heaven. Some people ask, has time ever been lost? How can you know which day the Sabbath is? There are at least three ways you can know. You can know from the Bible, you can know from language, and you can know from astronomy. You will recall that the Sabbath was stated at creation, and it was restated in the Ten Commandments given to Moses. It is clear that there was no time lost between Adam and Moses. Adam kept the seventh-day Sabbath, and so did Moses. All through the Old Testament, from Moses to Jesus, God's people kept the Sabbath. So there was no time lost there. The crucifixion story clearly reveals that the weekly cycle as we know it has not changed from Jesus' time until today. Let's look at the sequence of days from the Bible. We begin with the day Jesus died. The Bible describes it in this way, that day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew near. And the woman which had come with him from Galilee followed after, and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandments. Were the closest followers of Jesus keeping the Sabbath after He died? What does it say? They rested on the Sabbath according to the commandments. They did not believe that His death changed the commandment in any way. Here we have three days listed in succession, the day of Christ's death, the next day, the Sabbath according to the commandment, the seventh day. Then the Bible says, Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them, what did they do? They came to anoint his body. They came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. Let's look at the order of those events. So it is very clear. Order of events. You have three days. The preparation day, the day Christ died. What day was that? Friday. Preparation day. The next day, the Sabbath, the day he rested according to the commandment. What day was that? Saturday, the Sabbath day. And the next day, the first day of the week, when the women anointed his body. What day was Jesus resurrected? Sunday, the first day of the week. The identity of the Sabbath is clear. Sabbath is the seventh day of the weekly cycle, or the day that we call Saturday. Many Christians have said, but we worship on Sunday in honor of the resurrection. Christ has given us a symbol of the resurrection. And how do we celebrate the resurrection? 
Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So just as Jesus died, was buried, and was resurrected, we do that by being baptized. We come up from the watery grave to live the new life. Baptism is the New Testament symbol of the resurrection. The Bible says, remember the Sabbath day. You honor him as creator by keeping the Bible Sabbath. In over 140 languages of the world, the word for the seventh day of the week is Sabbath. In Spanish, it is Sabato. In Russian, Ukrainian, and Bulgarian, it is Sabota. In Arabic, it is As-Sabit. In all the cultures of the world, there is no question about this. When you look at the languages, it is very plain. The word for the day in English we call Saturday is Sabbath. According to such trustworthy sources as the Royal Greenwich Observatory in Greenwich, England, and the United States Naval Observatory, the weekly cycle has never changed. Jesus kept the Sabbath. Peter, James, John, and Paul kept the Sabbath. They came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures. Paul preached about Christ. It was the Sabbath. The interesting thing is that some Gentiles were there also. And so Acts 13.42 says, The Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Here Paul is with the Gentiles. These people are not Jews. He's teaching them about Jesus. The Bible says, On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. A whole city is coming. Praise God. What if everyone in your city came to worship the Creator every Sabbath? You see, the Sabbath represents the harmony of the human race. In Christ, we are one humanity. And on the Sabbath, we celebrate our oneness. When we come to worship Him on Sabbath, He bonds us together as one common humanity. The disciples kept the Sabbath. And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside, where prayer was customarily made. And we sat down and spoke to the woman who met there. In this city, there was no Sabbath-keeping church. So the Apostle Paul met with a group of believers by a quiet river to worship on the Sabbath. In these last days of verse history, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Revelation calls us back to true worship. But somebody says, oh, I thought Christians now were to keep the Lord's Day. Let's see what Revelation says. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. And someone says, oh, I keep the Lord's Day. But wait a minute. Does this text tell you which day the Lord's Day is? Human beings may try to define the Lord's Day, but Jesus knows better. Let's let Jesus define the Lord's Day. Matthew 12, 8. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Mark 2, 28. Therefore the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Luke 6, 5. The Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Why do you think the Bible includes the same thing three times? Because it's important. And if the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath, then the Sabbath must be the Lord's day. The Sabbath of the Creator God in Genesis is the Lord's day of Revelation. He's the same Creator in Revelation as He was in Genesis. Just as He declared to the first inhabitants of the earth, I blessed, sanctified, and rested upon the Sabbath, he calls all humanity to worship Him in the end times as well. He does not change. Here are the last people on earth. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The Sabbath, number one, given at creation. Number two, given at Sinai. Number three, kept by His people. Four, kept by Jesus. And five, honored by the disciples. Six is a sign of God's power. Seven will be kept on the new earth. For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants in your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. 
They will come from the north and the south, and they will come from the east and the west. They will come from China. They will come from Russia. They will come from Africa, the Americas, and from Europe. From all around the world, they will come. And together as one common humanity, together as brothers and sisters, as one family, we will come to Him to give praise, honor, and glory. Together, we will come to praise the Christ who created the heaven and the earth. We will come together with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We will come together to praise the Christ who died for us. Maybe you are thinking, this is new to me, but I know you have only one desire, and that is to follow Jesus and to do His will. Jesus, even if it's different from popular opinion, even if it's different from what conventional religion teaches, my heart wants only one thing, Bible truth. My heart wants only one thing, Jesus. Tonight, would you like to say, Jesus, teach me your truth. Wherever it leads me, I will follow. Would you like to say, dear Jesus, tonight, I want to follow you, no matter what others teach. I want to worship you as Creator and Lord, and every week find your Sabbath rest. For me, the most important thing in life is to follow Jesus. Is this your desire? Is this your commitment? Is Jesus' will more important to you than anything else in this life? If these things are your desire, just write in the comments section below, Dear Jesus, I will follow as you lead. Amen. And if this video has been helpful to you, and you would like others to see it too, make sure to like and share this video. For those of you watching live, we will now have a live question and answer session on this channel. And remember, this is part of a full series called Final Days. To watch the other videos in this series, just click the link on this screen. And if you're new, please subscribe and turn on all bell notifications so you hear about our next videos. But most importantly, friend, keep your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith.